What's your worst experience at work? Don't tell me. Um, I think our, our work environment is probably the area of our greatest testing in learning to work together and particularly if it's not a Christian environment and you have people uh, of no faith or have got different values and different morals and ethics and endeavouring to work together, I think it's, it's a great place for God to fashion our characters and to help us become more and more Christ-like as believers. The Apostle Paul, I love Paul's writings. Um, the letters of Paul are most inspiring. In fact, I would think Paul uh, would have to be the most influential person of the last 2,000 years outside of Jesus uh, because his writings kind of turned the Roman Empire upside down and it precipitated the changing of the Greek-Roman worldview, which was uh, controlled the world for hundreds and hundreds of years, probably uh, uh, nearly a thousand years as such. Greek thinking, philosophy, ideas, and uh, Roman power fused together. And though it was a, a great civilization in that they did a lot of great things, they also did a lot of horrible things, and their value base was, was terrible. So. When Jesus came on the scene, and as the reflection of, of the Father's love for humanity, full of truth and uh, full of mercy, full of grace, just his person and how he acted and reacted with people was so transformative for people to see God on earth in action relating to people, a God of truth and a God of mercy, a God of love, a God of perfect justice. Um, and so the Apostle Paul, as a new convert to Christ, and, and he got called to really be the vehicle by which the whole Christianity could break out of the Middle East into Asia Minor, into, into modern-day Turkey, up into Europe, into Greece, and then ultimately into Italy. And his letters are both uh, beautiful in the way they portray Christ and how we have a new identity in him, but also he gets very practical, right down practical on how do I live in this pagan world? How do I live in this Greek-Roman kind of paradigm? Uh, I'm a new creation in, in Christ. I have a new value system. I have new ideas, but I'm living in a real world that's pretty messed up and under uh, control of a, uh, a system that was not very pretty and was not very Christian. And so Paul writes his letters, and this one to the Ephesians is fantastic. So in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and 6, he talks about how do, you, how, how do husband and wives relate? How, how do them together as parents relate to their kids? How do kids relate to their parents? And, and how do bosses relate to their workers and workers to their bosses? Now, in the Roman system, one of the diabolical things in the Roman world was the institution of slavery. And so most of the manual work, most of the, the agricultural work and industrial work that occurred in mines was done by slaves. And this was a, a slave-based uh, workforce, not based on race, which was basically a newer phenomenon in the 14, 1500s. What happened in Africa with the African slave trade uh, was based on race and, and uh, kind of white superiority and, and people were kidnapped and taken to the Americas. Uh, this was based on conquered peoples. So the Romans, as they conquered, if the people were fairly submissive and opened the, the, their cities and, and didn't fight and not too many Romans were killed, well, they would spare them. And uh, they would... Uh, but they, if you put up resistance, and one of the punishments was that that whole people group would become slaves. So they became the workforce for the Roman Empire. So you had, I think it's around 15 million slaves in an empire of 60 million. They did all the work. And so um, it was a terrible system that ultimately was overturned by the gospel of Jesus. And these words of the Apostle Paul, I'm taking, uh, where you see slave, just put employee. Where you see slave master, just put boss or employer. And uh, these words are fantastic. And when you think about them, and last week I shared about employees, workers. But he says these words, slaves or employees, Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. 
Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. So last week, in us getting practical about work, I shared these five pointers from verses 5 to 8. For employees to be respectful, to be sincere, to be conscientious, to be wholehearted, and to be eternity-minded. And if you weren't here, you can get the message on YouTube or get it on our CFC uh, website. And um, as I share on what our responsibilities are as workers. Uh, Today I want to focus a little bit on, let's get practical, for those who are bosses, those who are in leadership. If you And that involves here in the church, if you are a leader in a small group or you're leading a ministry or at work, you might be a supervisor, you have people under you, how should we function? And this is what the Apostle Paul says. Firstly, show the respect you expect. Pretty simple, eh? And masters, treat your slaves, bosses, treat your employees in the same way. He is saying, you treat them as you want to be treated. You show the respect. You want respect from them, you show respect to them. This is the golden rule. Jesus' golden rule. There's to be no superiority in anyone who's a boss or a supervisor or a leader in the church or in the workplace. And Jesus says you cannot dispense with the normal courtesies of life that you expect from your workers. And I learned so much from being under various bosses. I had some good bosses, I had some lousy bosses. So I think I worked out I had around 11 different jobs uh, right up until coming into leadership of the church. And I started working for my dad when I was about eight years of age. I worked pumping petrol when I was 11 or 12 years of age. I set up my own little fruit business when I was 13. Made a lot of money out of that. Uh, Dad did all the hard work. I took the profits. And I set up a business in our community, uh, selling tomatoes and lettuces and cabbages and undersold all the the, the supermarkets and the shops. I used to go and find out how much they would sell tomatoes and I'd check those tomatoes. I'd go to Mrs. Hurd and Mrs. Searle and say, hey, you go to Bernie's, that shop, rotten tomatoes, and they're selling it for this much. Look at these beautiful bucks, eh? I said, and I'm going to give it to you for a couple of cents. That's, I was a really good salesman. I made a lot of money. That was my snooker money, my sport money, my entertainment money. Didn't save a cent in those days. So uh, I, I, I learned a lot of things. In, I was a little boss when I was 13, 14, but I was also under various bosses. And I tell you, some of them were terrible. Some of them were really good. And I vowed to myself, just sort of subconsciously, that I would try and be the best boss possible. And I never heard any of my staff ever say that until Pastor David Bland left the ABC and joined our staff here. And after a couple of years, he came to me and says, Bill, you are the best boss I've ever had. And so David was promoted enormously because of that statement. I mean, he, he went all the way. So I've been under bosses, and now I'm, I'm involved in leading three organisations, our church here, our CFC churches, and our CRC Church International. And uh, so my scope of leadership and overseeing and, and being the boss, I hate that term, uh, pastors sometimes ring the office and say, is the Pope in? We don't want to talk to him. And we say to them, don't use that language. And I said, because really we should change our titles and call ourselves, if you are the senior minister of a church, then maybe we should call them the senior slave of that church. Or if you are the national chairman, you are the national slave. Because the more you take responsibility in God's kingdom of leadership, the more you serve. The more you challenge to serve in a selfless way. Because Christ is the epitome of selflessness. And we battle with selfishness versus selflessness. So when I get in the road, I'm selfish. When Christ is truly living through us, we become selfless. And of course, more than that, not just servanthood leadership, not just selfless leadership, sacrificial leadership, which means to give of your very life to others. And so that's what Jesus did, and that's what he expects all of us 
to, to, to follow his example if we're going to be in any kind of leadership role. Hey, we're all equal before God. Do you realise that? We're all equal. And Paul wrote these words in Galatians. I'm just going to take a couple of passages, and, and this is a wonderful statement. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God. You're all children of God. Through faith, by putting your trust in him. For all of you were baptised into Christ. In other words, you've immersed yourself in him and you've clothed yourself with Christ. There is therefore now no Jew or Gentile. There's no racial barriers here. There's neither slave nor free. How's this? Nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is a positively revolutionary idea. This undermined the very foundations of the Greek-Roman worldview. Give me a break. Women were put down. Kids were put down. Slaves were put down. Mercy and grace and love were like swear words in the Roman Empire. Whereas power, position, prestige, politics, and uh, you know, pride and, and uh, arrogance were, were worshipped. Um, people, if, if you study Roman history, you, you probably heard of the term of, of Caesar's benevolence, Julius Caesar. He was the greatest Roman of them all, and he's a genius. I mean, he was a, a genius. He basically created modern politics as we know it today, by his own example. And uh, amazing human being. I've got a book I read on him just in, in the last few years about this thing from a new historian from Oxford, and uh, gave some new insights into Caesar's character. But uh, his benevolence, people think, oh, you know, he, he was kind of prefigured Christ, you know, he was merciful. Because in one of the great battles in Philippi, where he destroyed Pompey the Great in the, in the big civil war, and he spared Brutus and Cassius and all these people, hundreds of officers, he spared them, Caesar's clemency. People think, what was the motive behind it? Because Rome despised mercy. That action actually caused resentment in those people that weren't put to death. Because for the next 10 years, they had to live with the notion that they didn't die as noble Romans. They should have been executed. And so Caesar gave them back their life, but they were ridiculed by their families, they were ostracised, and they were forever under Caesar's dominance and control. And interesting, some of those men were the plotters who ended up assassinating him in 44 BC, Cassius and Brutus. So his acts of clemency were not because he felt merciful and wanted... He, he actually... Was, it was an act of selfishness to control those men and their families. I mean, it was terrible. I mean, Caesar deliberately seduced all the leaders of Rome, their wives. He conquered them. And people say, why did he do that for? Was he a sex addict? Maybe. But it was power, it was control. It was ridicule. It was saying, I am more powerful. I can win your wife over. It's all about power, not about love, relationships. And so he actually controlled the whole political environment by an amazing array of behaviours that we think, wow, they're awful. He also did a lot of good stuff, but he did a huge amount of, of terrible things. But this is the, the nature of the Roman world. It was ugly. And so for Paul to say, hey, if you're a Christian, you're all equal before God. Jew, Gentile, slave free, male, female. This transformed the Greek-Roman world order. And uh, it laid the basis for our Western Christian civilization that we have today. And, of course, you've got the, the, the crazy left and the crazy right, the extremes that are trying to take the Christian out of Western Christian civilization. You take it out, the whole thing's going to crumble because you've got to have a worldview. You've got to have a moral, ethical basis of why we do what we do. And if it's not the Greek-Roman worldview, if it's not the Islamic worldview, if it's not the atheistic worldview, there's got to be some worldview. And we say the Christian worldview is the greatest worldview because it's built on grace and mercy and equality before God. And so bosses and workers, Paul is saying, you have the same Lord. Slave owners, slaves, you have the same Lord. And you have the same judge. And he doesn't show partiality. He doesn't have favourites. We're all equal before God. So the maxim that we, we say is treat others as you want to be treated. It's a very, that's the golden rule. Do unto others as you have them do to you. And, and, and I render it, treat other people the way that you want to be treated. And if you practice this, 
It will change your world. In fact, if the world took that maxim, the world would be a better place. You think about it. Treat others as you want to be treated. You can change your marriage by this maxim. You can change your family dynamics, the way you treat your kids. Kids, the way you treat your parents. You can change your neighbourhood. You can change your workplace. You can change your sporting club. You can change your church community as we outwork this principle. It's a relational principle and truth that applies to all areas of life. And, and you can't separate it. In my role in leading the CRC, from time to time, you have to bring some loving correction to a pastor that might be doing the wrong thing. And I, I remember one situation where, where a whole pile of people left, a small church, not a large church, but a whole pile of people left the church. Um, the, the pastor wasn't behaving the best. And then I get a letter, about 30 of the last 40 people saying, either he goes or we go. He goes, this is not working. So when I sat down and we had to do a whole pile of interviews and, and found out how he was treating people and how he was behaving, it, it just shocked me that when I quizzed him, I said, do you behave like that at home? Do you treat your wife the way you treat that elder? Do you treat your kids the way you treat those home group leaders? Of course not. I said, what makes you think there's another set of relational principles that you can make it work in your home, but in, in the workplace you're going to be a bully? I said, it doesn't work that way. I said, you've got to treat people the way you want to be treated. So, so you can change your world by your marriage, your family, your neighbourhood, your workplace. There's, there should be no disconnect regarding how I conduct myself in my home and how I should conduct myself in my neighbourhood, how I should conduct myself in my workplace. Um, he didn't stay in that church, he couldn't. The people walked because he wasn't practicing what, what Jesus was saying. So if you remember that Jesus is your Lord now and one day will be your judge, he's going to help you and he will help you change your attitudes towards other people. So, so he is my Lord, he is my saviour. And he's also going to be my judge. I have to give an account to him. So I need to get my act together now because he's alive. He died on a cross for my sins. He was buried. He rose again. He sent the Holy Spirit to live within us. And with Jesus living in us through the Holy Spirit, we have divine power to make the changes that are needed to be able to get along with all kinds of people, to get along with your spouse, to get along with your family, get along at, at, at work. Look at Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. I died in him. The old life is dead. Jesus gave me my life back from the dead. It's a new life. He now lives within me through the spirit. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God. I trust him. Life in the body, in this world. And in Colossians 3, I love this one. He says here, in this new creation, in this, new, in this church, there's no Gentile or Jew, Paul says. There's no circumcised or uncircumcised. There's no barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. You could put male, female. But Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, he says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, you can put on Christ. Clothe yourself. With compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bear with one another, forbearance, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against somebody, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Wow. With Christ living in us and his presence and power through the spirit enabling us, we can transform our world. Our lives change. We become different men, different women. We're men of peace, women of love, children of patience, goodness. These things are, are in us now because Christ is in us. And if they're not, it's mainly because we're not walking as we should be with him. In, in humility and, and hum, you know, just humbling ourselves before him and prayerfully crying out to him and saying, Lord, I have a lack in these areas and yet all the resources of heaven are within me because you live within me. So this is the very first thing he says, is treat others as you want to be treated. He says, like, um, we're all equal before God. So show the respect you expect. And secondly, 
in this passage. Don't misuse your position of authority. If God has put you in a position of leadership, don't misuse it. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is their master and yours is in heaven. As parents are not to provoke their children, you read the context of the passage, and he says, parents, Paul is against violence in the home. I mean, you've got to believe it. I mean, people take the disciplined passages of Paul regarding kids. He never talks about physical corporal punishment. And I remember in, in the early 70s, there were Christian authors, you know, well-known authors who would raise, do books about Christian discipline. And they'd take Solomon's Proverbs out of context and basically saying, just beat the living daylights out of your kids if they misbehave. Get a big stick and call an attitude adjuster and whack them on the backside if they misbehave. And we were all duped into that. So we're all growing up to, if you're a good Christian, you're really, you spare the, spare the rod, you damn the child, you know. And so we use Solomon. And then it dawned upon me, two things dawned upon me. One, it didn't work with my kids. So it just didn't work. And secondly, I couldn't do it because I felt like I was backslidden when I did it. I couldn't discipline if I wasn't angry. So I found myself being angry. I'm like, I can't, I can't be angry. I said, this is got to be, supposed to be done in love and for their interest. I couldn't. If I raised my hand or grabbed a little stick, I never hit the, you know, like, but I thought, I can't do it. So I thought, you know what? And then it dawned upon me. Why am I following Solomon? He is a failed husband and a failed father. He's a great man, but I mean, he messed up his marriages and his kids. Have a look at Rehoboam. He was... A bad boy. So I'm thinking, why am I following him? I need to follow Jesus. What did Jesus say? You know what he said? You pray for your kids, you love them. You, you, and, and the Apostle Paul, he says, in the love and the admonition and the discipline of the Lord, and the discipline of the Lord is not violent. It's loving, it's corrective, it's strong. So I came up with new disciplinary measures that didn't have any aspect of violence. And I remember Nikki saying to me once, Dad, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. Smack me, smack me, belt me. Because what I came up with, the punishment, was far more severe. And she said, just give me a whack and let's be over and done with it. I said, no. God wanted to change her heart. I didn't want to just change behaviours. I wanted them to see Jesus. I wanted them to, to make changes. And so the Apostle Paul eschews any kind of violence and uh, in marriages, in raising kids with, with bosses and workers, slave masters and, and, slave, and slaves. He's against all that. So he's saying as parents are not to provoke their children, so bosses are not to threaten their workers. Don't misuse your position of authority. Treat them as people, not as statistics or machines. Threats are a weapon which the powerful wield over the powerless. And that's why a relationship, folks, based on threats is not a human relationship at all. It really isn't. And even in marriages, I see a lot of Christian manipulation. You know, where, where a Christian wife will try and extract love from her husband. Paul doesn't say that. Manipulate and kind of to get him to love. No, no, he has to choose to love. To love her as he loves his own body. To love her as Christ loves her. She can't manipulate him to actually, otherwise it's, it's, it's false love. It's not real love. Or husbands trying to, to force their wives to be submitted. It's not obedience. It's actually submission actually is as the church is submitted to Jesus because of his selfless sacrificial love, we lovingly lean into him as our covering. It has nothing to do with equality, we're both equal, but it's different roles, different responsibilities. And uh, so a husband can't force his wife. The moment he says, you have to, he's lost it. He just has to be responsible to love. She has to be responsible to be submissive. And uh, so it, they, they, that's their duties. It's not to enforce. Doesn't work that way. Becomes abusive. You know, how many times I've heard women say, he doesn't love me. Doesn't, you know, make him love me. I said, well, I can't do it. And neither can you. I said, you can't. I said, it has to be a work of God in his heart. He has to choose to, 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 to love you as Christ loves the church. So the most you can do is just you just be responsible with what 
your area of duty is. And pray like Billy O that God will touch his heart and change him. But there should be no threat. There should be no, no aspect of violence. And I mean violence verbally, emotional, spiritual. Violence can, can occur at all kinds of times. You know, like a person can be violent by giving the, the silent treatment and won't talk to a person for two days. They're punishing them. They won't talk to them. But the husband doesn't know what he's doing. Or there can be just withdrawal of, of, of the intimacy area as punishment. And all that is just, Paul says, all that's just garbage. That's just violent. That's just horrible. That's not the love of Christ. This is not treating people as you want to be treated. So whether it's with husbands and wives and parents and kids and, and bosses and workers, he says, hey, you treat them as you want to be treated and don't you misuse your position of authority in any way. Look at, look at Paul to this letter to Philemon. If you've never read the letter to Philemon, you've got to read it. Read it in the modern trend. It's a fantastic letter. If you've got to write a letter to somebody and it's a really delicate matter, it's an issue, and you think, how do I write a letter that I've got to correct, I've got to bring challenge and change, but I've got to do it in a Christian way. So Philemon is a slave owner, okay? And he got saved in Colossae. His slave, Onesimus, stole from him and ran away. Anyway, God providentially brings Paul into Onesimus' life, and Onesimus gets saved. <laughs> so now Paul has got Philemon as a friend, who's a slave owner. He's got Onesimus, and he finds out the story as Onesimus confesses his sins. Oh, okay, what do we do here? Because it was a capital offence. If a slave did that, they could be legally executed, because it was a serious crime of disrupting the Roman order. So Paul writes, and he says this, I love this. Remember, he's their boss. He's their boss. He is the apostle who oversees the planting of churches and, and bringing in new leaders, new pastors and new eldership teams. Like he, he is the boss of this New Testament church. So how does he treat Onesimus and how does he treat Philemon? Look what he writes to Philemon. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. How's that? Because I could. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. How's that? The great apostle. It is as none other than Paul, an old man now, also a prisoner of Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son. And so look at this. He says, he's my boy too. He's, he's a son. He's not just a convert. Who became my son while I was in chains. So I'm, I'm, I'm a prisoner and this boy ends up being, he, formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. So he's saying, he was a useless kid. He's told me the story. He did you harm. He was a little thief. He wasn't a nice boy. He's pretty useless to you. So he tells it honestly, but notice his, his approach. Because I'm sending him, who is my very heart. Talk about moral pressure. Like, he is my heart. Like, and that's like Philemon, you hurt him, you're hurting me. I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains. Now, I know, Philemon, that, that if you could, you would leave your wealth and your, 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 your properties and come and, and be my support. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But he's, he's pretty cluey in how to tap into the better angels of Philemon's nature. And Philemon goes, oh yeah, of course I would. But he goes, but look, Onesimus is taking your place. <laughs> and uh, I would have liked to keep him here with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. Notice how he honours him. So that any favour you do would not seem forced, not an ounce of payback, an ounce of, of, of manipulation, it's motivation, not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Get this, no longer as a slave 
but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Wow, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Now, do you think that's going to melt Philemon's heart? Man, it would slay him. He would be repenting before God if he had any attitude towards Onesimus. He'd be kind of going, oh, like he, he just knows that this is a brotherhood, that we have a father in heaven who's going to judge us both. And, uh, and, and so he, he doesn't, Paul appeals to him, don't misuse your, your authority. When I was uh, teaching, and, um, and, and uh, this principal gave me a great job, terrific job. I could serve the Lord, for, uh, teach from 9 to 12, well, initially 9 to 10, then, then it became three hours a day, and, and, um, and the church was paying me here for, I think it was 1979, for half a day, and I was working... Um, but the school was probably paying me twice as much as what the church could pay me so as a qualified teacher. So I'm, I'm teaching and, and enjoying it. Um, but he was a little bit difficult. He was a good man, but he was just difficult. And, and every so often, he'd do something that was just odd, a bit extreme. And um, so one day I find out that we go to lunchtime and Rob, the teacher's not there. He's been sacked. What happened? Because I swore at the boss. Got instantly sacked. Okay, what did the boss do? Well, he would, they said the plate moved. And they, what's the plate moving? He goes, well, this is the story. He had a war wound in the Second World War, got shot in the head, and they reckon that the surgeons, to, to get him back to normal, stuck a plate in his head, and every so often it would move, and then he'd go a little bit, mm. I don't think it's true, but anyway. So, so they said the plate moved. They told me the story. And then another teacher, she resigned in sympathy for the guy because she thought it was unjust. So, so then he, of course, he used to walk in to the lunchroom and sit at the head table. So everyone would just go, quiet, he's there. And he just would just eat his food and not talk too much. Like he's just a little bit. But he paid well and he loved the school and he loved the kids. One day I'm teaching and he walks into my classroom and the look on his face, you could see the plate had moved. <laughs> like, like stands there like a robot. Mr. Vasilakis, yes. All the kids, the tone, the tone of it. Mr. Vasilakis, yes. I've had a report from some of these kids' teachers, uh, parents, that you're not setting enough homework for them. And they pay a lot of money for these kids to go to school and they all have to pass, you know, we, we, et cetera. They so say, you've got to set them more homework. And I'm going to double check it. You know, like, you know we're going to, this is going to have to change. And all the kids are, are crawling under the seat in embarrassment. So he tells me off in front of the students that I'm teaching. What would you do in that situation? I've got to think on my feet. I remembered a few weeks earlier that Rob got the sack for saying something he shouldn't have said. <laughs> so I'm a Christian. I'm saying, oh, Jesus, help me in this one. I don't know what to do. So it's one of those prayers, those Nehemiah prayers. You shoot them up saying, whoa, what do I do? And, uh, and, and what would you do in a similar situation? Would you react negatively as the devil would like us to? Or do we react, respond positively with the mind of Jesus? And I figured this in a very short period of time. I figured, you know what? He gave me a job when nobody else would give me a job. He pays me really good money. Thirdly, what has he asked me to do? Has he asked me to commit a crime? No. Has he asked me to hurt the kids? No. Has he asked, he's actually, has he asked me to do a good thing? Yeah, it actually is a good thing to set a bit more homework because I think he must have picked it because I didn't believe in homework. I didn't believe in homework or exams. I just think they're hopeless. So if I was in charge of the education system in Australia, I'd ban all homework and ban all exams. <laughs> I kind of figured if you've got the kids for six hours and you can't teach them, why torment them for the next three hours at home when they should be having fun, you know, and all that stuff. Anyway, so anyway, I was sprung. He found out I wasn't setting enough homework. So, but I figured, you know, he's only asked me to do something that's good in the kids' best interest. He didn't do it the right way. That's his problem. 
He didn't do it the right way. He should have said, Bill, or he would never call me to say, Mr. Vasilakis, come into the office, and he could have sat me down and talked to me without the... That's the way you do it. He didn't do it the right way. But he wasn't committing a crime. He wasn't deliberately trying to hurt me. In fact, he only diminished himself in the eyes of the kids. That's the truth, because they got embarrassed. And so I chose to respond positively, because as a Christian, I could see it from a different perspective. And, uh, and, but it taught me to say, you know what, I don't want to misuse my position of authority. Sometimes bosses do, and they cross a line, and what do we do as Christians? Do we react or do we respond? If they ask you to break the law, no way. If they ask you to, to, to do evil, no way. If they ask you to hurt another person, no way. Someone in the first service said, oh, I had someone who wanted me to dock another hundred bucks on the thing, and I said, no. And the guy said, why not? Let's make a little bit of profit from the insurance. He goes, I can't do it. I'm a Christian. Believe in honesty. I think that's right. Don't steal. Don't, don't lie. Don't, don't put extra hours in to work and charge extra. We don't do that. Hey, we believe in justice for all. And Paul says here, and this is amazing, this is a seditious concept. If the Roman secret police had got hold of this, they may have spun a case in the Roman courts to, to have him tried. He says this, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Again, Colossians. Justice for slaves was a seditious concept in the Roman worldview. It was the gospel that insisted that slaves had rights. And Paul taught a reciprocal nature to slave-master relationships. For if slaves had duties to their masters, masters had duties to their slaves. Hey, look, in labour relations today, um, the same basic principle holds true in our, in our, in our system. It, it's of justice based on reciprocal rights. Employers and employees alike have duties. Workers' duty is to give good work. The boss's duty is to pay a just wage. The major problem I see in management of labour disputes is that each side concentrates on securing their own rights and in inducing the other side to do their duty, like I was saying about husbands and wives. Paul reverses this emphasis and he urges each side to concentrate on their responsibilities and not on their rights. So if modern industrial disputes, um, if the concern was for each side to fulfil their own duty and secure the other's rights, then labour relations would be totally transformed. I think so. I think if we took this principle and applied it. Um, you know, like in, in recent days, the Fair Work Australia, the Industrial Court, Fair Work Australia, anyway, Fair Work, they, they took away penalty rates from uh, the hospitality industry on weekends. And I thought, okay, that's a bit weird. You want to take that away? It didn't just seem fair to me. It didn't seem just to me. And I would have thought, I said to Cathy, why don't they just kind of give a 12-month sunset clause so people who are used to that extra amount of money working on Sundays, they've got 12 months to readjust. That would be fair. And maybe new people in the hospitality industry, maybe they should start without having penalty rates. I don't know. But it just didn't seem fair and right. And I thought, here, these are pretty brainy people. These are judges. And yet the common people felt, you know what? Something doesn't quite add up there. So we all feel that. Justice for all. And Paul says it's important. Finally, he, makes, he says, and there is no favouritism with him. He says, show the respect you expect, don't misuse your position of authority, and have no prejudice towards anyone. No one. The Christian boss is reminded that everything they say or do to their workers must be said or done remembering that they have a Lord and Master in heaven. I mean, look at Jesus as he's dying on a cross. Does he favour anyone? No. He's drawing grace. He draws in a centurion who's an elite man in the Roman world, and he gets saved. He also draws in a crook who's being executed next to him, who'd committed crimes, stealing, robbing, killing, who knows what he did. And yet both, the Holy Spirit draws them and opens their hearts as they see Jesus dying on a cross. And there you just see the impartiality of, of, of God. Um, and in God's new society, that we belong to. We have one Father in heaven. We have one Saviour, Jesus Christ. We have one Holy Spirit who indwells us. We have one family, one household. 
There are no celebrities here. It's only Jesus who's the celebrity. And we honor him. We worship him. There's, there's no favoritism. We honor everyone. And we say, and, and what thrills me in the life of the church here is seeing people who are bosses in the church and in, and in the workforce who really do it the Jesus way. And I've asked two of them to come and share. Pastor Lockie, who oversees Lachlan Donaldson's, one of our pastors. He oversees our, our young adults ministry, maybe 80 to 100 young adults all up in the life of the church. And, um, and he has received some promotions and he's now a supervisor in his work at his tender young age. Fantastic. And, uh, but he's been a very experienced leader in the life of the church from a little kid growing up in the church. Jan is a super deputy principal. I mean, she's a top boss. I mean, and you wouldn't mess with Jan. And she runs, along with my wife, the kitchen ministry, like today's lunch and all that stuff. They have something like 70, 80 people on the team and eight teams. And, and, uh, and so she's excelled in education and in leadership and also both of them in the life of the church. So guys, let me ask you this question. Come a little bit closer. Don't be frightened of the people. Just, and look at them. Don't have to look at me. Look at them and tell them what I'm... <laughs> Lockie, to start with you, you're a child of the church. You grew up here. You're pretty experienced in, in ministry and leadership. And you're running young adults, and you're not, you're not salaried, you're a pastor doing it. How different is it being a worker to now being a boss? You lead a ministry, you have a team, you now are a supervisor at work, you were one of the boys, now you're one of the leaders. How, has it changed you, both of you? Has it changed you, the essence of your character and your approach to, to life, work and ministry? Um, I don't think so. So I guess... Having been an employee and still being an employee, still work for someone for a few years now, you just try and use the lessons, I guess, the good and the bad that you've seen in other people, and then try and implement that in the way that you manage. Um, and I think, I guess, based on that Ephesians 6 passage, as an employee, you're trying to make your boss's job easier. Um, not trying to promote yourself above, above your peers, but work in a way which, you know, the overall team as a whole is performing well rather than yourself and as individual. And I think as a boss, that's what I want to see from my guys as well is not one person promoting themselves above the rest but for everyone to perform and to get better results across the board. And I think moving into a supervisory role kind of changed my mindset a little bit or my expectations a little bit so it's not... I guess, imposing the same um, attitudes on the guys that work for me, but rather to um, take on, I guess, the servant leadership approach like you were talking about this morning and to, as I allocate tasks and projects and responsibilities to the guys in the team, to make sure they have their clear expectations and are resourced with all the information they need and the hours and whatever else in order to get the job done and to really make sure that every time I give a task that I'm spending a reasonable amount of effort to make sure that they've got everything they need to perform at the highest possible standard. And to t I guess each team, each workplace has a, a number of jobs which are probably more overheads or not really what you want to do while you're there and to make sure that I'm not delegating all of those things, but probably even taking a disproportionate amount of that upon myself. I see that as an example of servant leadership. And then to also not take all the interesting work for myself, but to make sure that's going down and that everyone is enjoying being at work. And Boy, you, you're a fulfillment. good boss. I wouldn't mind working under him, eh? Wow, that's a good boss. How old are you? 30? Uh, almost. Almost, wow. Man, he's a lot more together at 30 than I was, I tell you. So uh, you're a good boss. Jan, are you as good a boss as him? No, no, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, morning, everybody. Um, I'm a deputy principal at a local primary school. We've got 500 students, about 360, 380 families within the school. I've got a staff of between 40 and 50, so it's fairly big. And I've been here working with Cathy in the kitchen for 20 years. I've been teaching, for, yeah, it's coming up 20 years this year. Um, teaching 40 and I've been in leadership for 20 years. 
So, yeah, it's been, here she comes. I'm in trouble now. I'll have to watch what I say. Um, <laughs> you heard your name, didn't you, Kathy Bass? Um, yeah, it's... When you go into a leadership role, it's really, really different in the fact that... I um, always say, I said this morning, you've got to walk a mile in my shoes. It's, it's really different. You never, ever ask anyone to do something that you wouldn't be willing to do yourself. Cool. Um, ever. Mm. And that includes when you're in the job I'm doing now, it could be cleaning up a kid that's dead themselves, it could be cleaning up vomit, emptying toilets, cleaning out toilets, it can be all that sort of stuff, you know, um, it, it, as well as working with kids and, and parents and that sort of thing. Um, and teachers, you never ever ask anyone to do, unless they can do it better than you. And I've got a few staff that do quite a few things better than I do. And, and that's when you enable them and you raise them up and say, look, I can't do this, I need help. And there's nothing wrong with saying that as well. Um, so the thing is to empower and enable staff that you're working with uh, and lift them up and praise them up. Yeah, that's very good. Um, I mean, you, you guys exemplify servanthood leadership and, and in a selfless way. Um, which, which is uh, great. So you do actually clean toilets, Jan. You're the deputy principal. Yep. Know how to do it. Yeah. You know, you, just between you and I, you know, I clean my toilet upstairs. Good. Yeah. But what, do, you, do you clean it when it's blocked? Sorry? Do you ever clean it when it's blocked? No, I'll call the plumber in for that. <laughs> because we have to pay for it. We learn how to do it. It's really quite amazing. <laughs> I've learned a lot of things. Now, now tell me... Um, Plus how to drive the lawn on, right as, on lawnmower. As bosses both in the church and outside the church, when you have somebody who's not... You've done all the best you can do in preparing them, you're being pretty selfless, but they're, they're not... They've kind of... They're crossing a line and you have to correct. Um, it's the most unpleasant tasks of, of leadership. So how have you embrace that, to actually lovingly correct a person without putting, respecting their dignity, and yet you have to do it. Some, that's the responsibility. So how have you handled that? You're in a newer leadership role, Lockie. How have you done that? Yeah, so I guess to start with, I've tried to do all the right things to avoid being put in that position. So in terms of just getting the right people in the right roles and setting them up to succeed, and even feedback so it'd be providing positive feedback along the way so that when it comes to giving some more constructive feedback i think that's the politically correct term um it's it's not unprecedented it's not like we've never sat down and talked about performance before so it creates an opportunity a bit of a window that people are probably a bit more receptive to that yeah that's good and then yeah i guess making having the discipline of uh, assuming a little bit of humility and um, being open to the opportunity that maybe I haven't set them up for success as well as I could have. Um, or just, yeah, going the, to the conversation, yeah, not assuming that I'm 100% of the right, but giving the opportunity for some feedback backwards, as well as being aware that, yeah, if they've been performing well in this role for a long time and something's changed in their performance, let's... Be aware that maybe there's some external factors which need to be considered and just... So it could be they could have had some difficulties in their home that, or a child that's sick and there's pressures and they're not performing. So do you, do you go into that? Do you try to find out what's happening in their personal life? Um, uh, not the gory details, but, yeah, if they need more margin, then, yeah, there's an opportunity to have a conversation about that and readjust work so that they've got the margin they need to still do the response to that they can do to the best of their ability. That's good. Great. Jen? Yeah, we do what they call performance management it's two to three times a year, which we meet with teachers and all staff um, and sit down and have a chat and see how they're going and bring up any issues they might have that we've done wrong um, and, and vice versa. Um, the day-to-day -day stuff, one of the things I hated as a teacher was someone, someone from leadership coming in and saying, I need to see you at the end of the day. And then you spend all day going, yeah. oh, God, what have I done now? <laughs> all right. Um, that's probably one I avoid. Um, one of the best ways I do it will be a very off-the-cuff, quiet thing when you're you know, off on your own somewhere and say, look, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. Tell me the story. This is what I've heard. 
and get the whole picture first because there's always two sides to every story yeah, and yeah. the truth lies in the middle somewhere usually. Um, yeah, and then, and then work through it. So, yeah, there's usually with most situations um, something that's gone on in the peripheral like family, you know, health, that sort of stuff. And I usually find out, they usually tell you the, the gory details because they're happy to get it off their chest. Yeah. And then the whole story comes out and then you can work through it with them from that time on. Right. And sometimes you have to put things in place to help them because quite often it might be mental health issues and that, and that sort of stuff. could be financial, it could be all sorts of stuff and yeah. you've got to work through it. So you might have to get outside agencies in yeah. to give them a hand. So you don't sort of hang them out to dry. Yeah, it's good. Well, you can see that they're good leaders, aren't they? Both in the life of the church and in the workplace. Someone... Um, made a comment, I think it was Bill Hybels many years ago, that there's been analyses done of how difficult is it in a volunteer-based organisation compared to a salaried organisation, so not-for-profits, churches, and there is an argument to say that it takes a higher level of leadership competence to handle volunteers because you haven't got, they're not paid, and they choose to come. And the level of motivation, the level of, of skill to build a team, actually, it, it, it causes you to become a more effective leader. And, I, and I, I see that in the life of the church. People who really succeed well in building teams in the life of the church usually succeed very well in the workplace because there you've got the sanction of it's employment, salary, and, uh, and there's that kind of termination, all that. So you guys, uh, I think uh, you might be running the project in five years Lucky the way you're going. So, uh, Jan, Lucky, thank you for sharing uh, with us this morning. Let's put our hands together and a call.